Um, we first need to have a long round of applause for Ms. Carolyn for putting up with us for the last three weeks. So Ms. Carolyn, thank you graciously. Now she has the added pressure of Randy back there and he has got a notepad and he is taking notes today. So watch this. And so he is trying to do this just to, he's trying to, he's doing this for meanness. I know he is. And Randy, we're glad you got back safely and so we're glad to have you back. So, and Miss Betty, we're glad to have you. Where are you, Miss? Oh, Miss Betty, it's Miss Betty's birthday today and so we're glad to have her back here today too. So this is a wonderful day. Um, if you would get a copy of your bulletin, let's go over some announcements. Um, first, um, you'll see a Sunday school, Wednesday night, and choir practice, the church's weekly calendar. Today, the nominating committee will meet right after worship. It will be a short meeting. You see the note on Brown Marsh Day. Remember that we will start taking up our peace offering for this church on October 2nd. That's one of our four big ones throughout the PCUSA. And so we'll have a flyer in the bulletin probably next week on that. I haven't seen it yet, but I'm, I'm assuming we will. Um, I did get a note this week about um, the 100th McEwen reunion will be Saturday, October 8th, 2022. Um, from 12 to 2, the lunch and family history will be held at the Clarkton Depot. And then from 2 o'clock until will be family time, music, more history, and desserts at the Robert and Odessa McEwen home place on White McEwen Road. So anyway, I was sent this note this week and if anyone's interested or feels, would like to participate, um, I think pretty much a lot of people are connected to the McEwen family and the McKee families and things like that. I'll make you a copy of this if you'd like it. And so we'll do that. Also, there's a note on the back of the bulletin for the baby shower for timber. We want to pay attention to that. And I did save my cemetery committee um, notices on the plots going up. So um, I've saved it. I'll keep up with that if anyone needs a copy of what we did. And it's in the newsletter, but we will keep that close by. On your prayer list, um, I need to add the family of Sonia Lanier Floyd. Sonia passed away this past week. And also we need to remember Miss Ronnie Rush and her brother Richard Bridgers died. Also, we would like to add Cliff Hester. Cliff has had some health complications. Um, and also Otis Evans from Bladenboro. Otis has had some health complications. And we did have a couple of people getting better. Dwayne Priest was improving. I think he was coming home from the hospital. And also, I think, Linda, you had a good visit with Miss Esther Collier this past week. And so we'd like to, um, maybe she's highlighting a little bit as a joy. So with that, let us worship.
please rise and in, in body or spirit and join with me in our responsive call to worship. O oh Lord, you are the God of our salvation. We have no hope without you. Hear us when we call to you. O oh Lord, you are the compassionate God. Who cared for our ancestors and parents. Come and save us from the O oh Lord, you are the changeless God, whom we honor and revere. We come this day to worship you, O oh God, because we trust you. Let us pray. O oh God, you are rich in love for your people. Show us the treasure that endures, and when we are tempted by greed, remind us of your lavish mercy. Call us back into your service and make us worthy to be entrusted with the wealth that never fails. We ask this through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. <laughs> Compassion and forgiveness belong to the Lord our God. Though we have rebelled in sin, let us then renounce our will, willfulness and seek God's mercy by confessing our sins. Praying for, first together and then in silence. Eternal God, in whom we live and move and have our being, your face is hidden from us by our sins, and we forget your mercy in the blindness of our hearts. Cleanse us from all our offenses and deliver us from proud thoughts and vain desires. With lowliness and meekness, may we draw near you, confessing our faults, confiding in your grace, and finding in your ref refuge and strength through Jesus Christ, your Son. God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. 
Those who believe in him are not condemned. The good news, therefore, is this. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Almighty God, in you are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Open our eyes of, of our hearts that we may see the wonders of your word and give us grace that we may clearly understand and freely choose the way of your wisdom. Through Christ our Lord, amen. Our Old Testament lesson is from Amos 8, verses 1 through 12. This is what the Lord God showed me, a basket of summer fruit. He said, Amos, what do you see? And I said, a basket of summer fruit. Then the Lord said to me, the end has come upon my people of Israel. I will never again pass them by. The songs of the temple shall become wellings in the day, says the Lord God. The dead bodies shall be many, cast out in every, every place, be silent. Hear this, you that trample on the needy and bring to ruin the poor of the land, saying, When will the new moon be over so that we may sell grain? And the Sabbath, so that we may offer wheat for sale. We will make the ephah small and the shekel great and practice deceit and false balances, buying the poor for silver and the needy for a pair of sandals and selling the sweepings of the wheat. The Lord has sworn by the pride of Jacob, Surely I will never forget any of their deeds. Shall not the land tremble in this account? And everyone who mourn, every mourn, everyone mourn who lives in it, and all of it rise like the Nile, and be tossed about and sink again, like the Nile of Egypt. On that day, says the Lord God, I will make the sun go down at noon and darken the earth in broad daylight. I will turn your feast into mourning and all your songs into lamentation. I will bring sackcloth on all loins and boldness on every head. I will make it like the morning for an only son and the end of it like a bitter day. The time is surely coming, says the Lord God, when I will send a famine on the land, not a famine of bread or a thir thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. They shall wander from sea to sea and from north to east. They shall run to and fro seeking the word of the Lord, but they shall not find it. The word of the Lord. Thanks. Matthew thirteen thirty four records these words, Jesus spoke all these things to the crowd in parables. He did not say anything to them without using a parable. So we know from scripture that the, uh, the parables were one of the primary means by which Jesus used to teach those who were listening to him. And the problem, as I've said with parables, is that there are so many different ways to interpret them. We follow down a path and we think we understand where it's taking us and then all of a sudden we end up in a different place. The New Testament scholar of the last century, C.H. Dodd, once said that a parable is a story, the meaning of which is sufficiently in doubt so as to tease the imagination into faithful thought. Well, with the parable this morning, we definitely will get that sufficiently in doubt part. It's never reassuring to a preacher when one reads commentary after commentary and it says this is the most difficult to interpret of Jesus' parables. So I thought, gee, thanks. So that's a disclaimer for this sermon. 
difficult text and a difficult sermon, but God will get us through, I'm sure. Luke chapter 16, I will begin reading at the first verse till the the 13th verse. Jesus told his disciples, there was a rich man whose manager was accused of wasting his possessions. So he called him in and asked him, what is this I hear about you? Give an account of your management, because you cannot be my manager any longer. The manager said to him, to himself, what shall I do now? My master is going to take away my job. I'm not strong enough to dig, and I'm ashamed to beg. I know what I'll do when I lose my job here, and people will welcome me into their houses. So he called in each one of his master's debtors. And he asked the first, how much do you owe my master? 900 gallons of olive oil, he replied. The manager told him, take your bill, sit down quickly, and make it 450. Then he asked the second, how much do you owe? A thousand bushels of wheat, he replied. He told him, take your bill and make it 800. The master commended the dishonest manager because he acted shrewdly. For the people of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own kind than are the people of the light. I tell you, use worldly wealth to gain friends for yourself, so that when it is gone, you will be welcomed into eternal dwellings. Whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much. And whoever is dishonest with very little will also be dishonest with much. So if you have not been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth, who will trust you with true riches? And if you have not been trustworthy with someone else's property, who will give you property of your own? No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be found acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. There's a story told, probably an apocryphal story, about a great violinist who was playing a violin that was of immeasurable value. And once during the course of a concert, he suddenly stopped what he was playing. He took the violin and he smashed it over the chair, breaking it into little pieces. The audience was stunned, aghast, and the violin player rose quickly to relieve their anxieties. And he said, do not be alarmed. I did not smash my priceless Stradivarius. No, I was playing on a cheap instrument for a student worth only a few dollars. Now I shall play the piece on the Stradivarius, whereupon he continued to play the selection he was playing and finished. Surprisingly, the people in the audience couldn't tell the difference. And the violinist said, There has been so much made over the monetary value of my beautiful Stradivarius that I wanted to demonstrate for you that the music is not in the instrument. The music is in the one who plays it. Not the instrument. The music is in the one who plays it. And there's a spiritual truth found in that, isn't there? We make a fuss over a person's net worth in our culture. We, we're a very materialistic society. We're oriented toward being consumers. If you have enough money, you can get your way. That's why it's valuable. My dad once said that the real golden rule is the one who has the gold makes the rule. And so we want to know who has the gold, who makes the rules, what are they worth? And so we're, we're curious and our jaws drop sometimes with a little envy when we find out what celebrities make or professional athletes, actors or actresses, even university presidents and coaches. We're also curious about how politicians 
end up so much wealthier after leaving office. Their salaries are public record. So where did all that extra money come from, we wonder? In the gospel lesson for today, Jesus tells a parable to the money-loving Pharisees, we're told. There was a steward employed by a wealthy man, and he was accused of squandering his boss's assets. The dishonest steward, the, the shrewd manager, realized that he was about to be fired. The boss was going to figure everything out, so what to do? He doesn't want a, a job digging ditches, too, too much manual labor in that profession, and he has no, no sensibilities for becoming a beggar. And so he comes up with a thoroughly clever but fraudulent scheme. While he's still holding the job, he will go to some of the people who owe his master money, and he'll take their bills and reduce them by as much as 50%. And he reasons that after he's lost the job, the people who profited from his scheme will become friends and will welcome him into their homes and care for him. It's a clever scheme for sure, and even the master whom he defrauded seems to think that he was a very shrewd manager, and Jesus seems impressed with his resourcefulness as well. And so you see the dilemma, the, the preacher's dilemma. What in the world do we make of this parable? What kind of management strategy is this? You can't run a business this way, not if you want to stay in business. And you can change the variables a bit. For example, if you're a, a professor and you have um, a, a teaching assistant helping with the grading, and that teaching assistant gets in trouble, the assistant may inflate students' grades to try to, to make friends with the student and benefit in some other way. There are plenty of ways to change the variables in the parable, but no matter which way you do, you look at it, it's, it's, it's crooked management. And the interesting thing, as one of the commentators pointed out, is that, that God seems to love crooks because the Bible's full of them. And he, he listed the, the quote of Mark Twain, who said that the Bible was a spectacular collection of the immoral, liars, cheaters, adulterers, murderers, and con artists. Go back to the very beginning, to the book of Genesis. Remember, Cain murders his brother Abel. And Jacob the mama's boy who cheated his brother Esau out of his inheritance, one of God's favorites, too. We think of King David with the, the Bathsheba incident. Would have landed him on the front pages of the Jerusalem tabloids. But we're told in Scripture that he was a man after God's own heart. On and on the stories go. The Bible's full of crooks, sinners, because even the best saint is still a sinner. And maybe our misdeeds aren't as spectacular as some of theirs. Let's hope not. But we're all morally ambiguous, even the best of us. And maybe there's a clue in there for what Jesus has in mind. When we look at some of his other parables, the prodigal son, lost coin, lost sheep, the rich fool, we might have a clearer understanding or thought about the direction of where Jesus might want us to go. But the dishonest manager, this crooked manager, what does Jesus have in mind? Well, there are many possibilities, but here are a few thoughts. The parable starts and takes us through verse 8, and then the second half of verse 8, we're encouraged to be shrewd. It says, for the people of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own kind than the people of the light. I tell you, Use worldly wealth to gain friends for yourself, so that when it is gone, you will be welcomed into eternal dwellings. The people of this world are more shrewd. Think about the people who write computer viruses. Uh, there was the news piece just the other day about the, the couple who had wiped out the, the reservations at one of the major hotel chains. Think about the brain power that you need to do destructive evil acts. Think about these high-tech criminal activities. The level of sophistication of modern weaponry for warfare is mind-boggling. Drones, chemical warfare, cyber warfare. What if all that brain power was put to good use? Instead of using 
our energy and intelligence to create evil on the one hand or to fight that created evil on the other, what if instead we use that energy to, to fight cancer or COVID? We might have a cure by now. Bring things a little closer to home. And we're challenged to face the way we use our own mental energies with respect to our life of faith. How shrewd are we when it comes to our spiritual lives? How much time do we devote to the things of God, like study and prayer, worship, service? And I'm not talking about work at the church specifically, because a lot of church business isn't all that spiritual. This comes more down to being with respect to our relationship with God, the time and talent treasure the things we need to invest to maintain our relationship with God. If we want to do something good in life, if we have an, a hobby or an endeavor, a particular pursuit, if you want to be good at it, you've got to work at it. The crooked manager in this parable used his brain power to get himself out of trouble. Instead of using our brain power only to serve ourselves, our self-interest, Perhaps what Jesus is asking us to do is to think about how we could use our energies for the good of others. Verse 9 is about using our worldly wealth to gain friends. We are blessed to be a blessing to others. And in the Judaism of Jesus' time, it was believed that charity given to the poor was a credit to the person in the world to come. And so a person's true wealth was not what was kept, but rather what was given away to be a blessing for others. And that's why the verse speaks of being welcomed into eternal places. Matthew 10, verse 16 says, Be as shrewd as snakes and as innocent as doves, or wise as serpents and innocent as doves. Jesus invites us to be smart with how we use our resources. But he's also telling us we need to be good. We need to do good for others. Now, since this is a a parable about stewardship, the next few verses deal with stewardship, our stewardship. (laughs) Verse 10, whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much. Whoever is dishonest with little will also be dishonest with much. So if you have not been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth, who will trust you with true riches? And if you have not been trustworthy with someone else's property, who will give you property of your own? There's a story, a funny story from long ago. There was a a country church out in the middle of a field And it seems that their preacher ran off with some of the church's offering. He took a couple hundred bucks and fled. The outraged congregation tracked him down and dragged him back. And one of the members of the church was visiting with a friend and recounting the incident. And the friend said, well, what about the money? Did you get the money back? No, the parishioner said he'd already spent it. But we're not worried about it. We're going to make him preach it out, every last cent of it. We've all been entrusted with something, some kind of gift or resource or skill or ability. And we have to be accountable for how we use what God has given to us. If we can't be trusted to use our worldly wealth, our resources, wisely, then why would we think God would trust us with what verse 11 calls true riches. In a parable like this one, Jesus invites his followers to stop and take stock of life in its totality. That's what stewardship is about. It's not about writing a check to a cause because most of life's problems will not be solved by money. Stewardship is about how we live our lives in response to the gracious grace of our loving God. And when we're faithful in small ways, that opens the possibility for God to entrust us with more. Well, the final challenge comes down to making a decision as to whom we will serve. Who will be our master? 
And this is the direction, because this is where the, this selection ends. Verse 13, no one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. And in that famous line, you cannot serve both God and money, or mammon, the older language. Today, we might be employed by any number of different people. We might work for different causes. But what Jesus is referring to here is... Um, as someone who belongs to another, works for one master. And so a slave, for example, does not belong to two masters, cannot work for two masters. And so he's questioning whether we can divide our loyalty. Can you serve two masters? And the answer, of course, is no. Jesus says to his disciples, we need to decide. Are we going to serve God or are we going to serve money? Are we going to serve God, or are we going to serve ourselves? It's a choice. We have to make a choice. Discipleship involves making a choice to follow Jesus. Now, even with a difficult parable like this, where we might try to distance ourselves from it, we're still faced with the, the mirror that is Scripture. We have to look at our own moral ambiguities. And maybe when we look into the mirror that is scripture, we can see where our loyalties are divided at certain points. Maybe you're trying really hard to serve two masters, but you know in your heart that Jesus is right. You can't divide your loyalties. It doesn't work out. And the good news is that we don't have to try so hard. Jesus said, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon me and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble of heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Jesus isn't trying to burden us with something new. He's inviting us to trust and experience love and grace and forgiveness. And so it doesn't matter what kind of instrument we are. It doesn't matter how perfect we are, how pure we are, because the music is not from the instrument. When we de dedicate our lives to service of Jesus Christ, it is the music that God plays through us that makes all the difference. And it's nothing less than extraordinary. Let us pray. Most gracious and loving God, we give you thanks and praise for all that you have given to us and entrusted to us. And we ask that you would help us see those ways where we can serve you more faithfully and dedicate our energies more shrewdly to your service to be a blessing to others. Strengthen us in our discipleship and help us to choose daily to serve you and follow you. For we ask this in your name. Amen.
Now let us together affirm our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. Christian, what do you believe? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended in hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. And thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and a life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray. Lord, our God, we ask that you bless us at this time and help us to recognize the great privilege and challenge you've called us to. Grant that, as Jesus said, we may have the shrewdness of the serpent, the gentleness of the dove, that we might truly seek as members of your church, as the body of Christ, to minister to your world and to be a blessing to others. Lord God, make us, as your people, those who seek to follow the path of Christ Jesus, your Son, each and every day, and to proclaim your saving love in all that we say and do. Help us to take time for you each day, no matter what is on our schedules, to meet you, to sit quietly and listen for your word as we read scripture and pray and worship together. Help us to follow your voice and not be turned aside from that center from which everything flows. And give us, we pray, the grace to minister to the needs of others to truly listen with all of our hearts, to honestly and faithfully do what we can and trust all to you. We thank you, O God, for carrying us when we cannot walk in your way on our own strength. Bless our loved ones with an awareness of your presence. Meet each one's need with your gracious help. To the sick, give health. To the anxious, give peace. To all who long to know your will, give them the guidance of your loving Holy Spirit. Show us, we pray, each of us, in our hearts and minds, the way that we should be going. And help us to be faithful managers, faithful stewards of all that you have entrusted to us. Today, O Lord, we recall those individuals and circumstances that you have placed upon our hearts, those that we have shared during our sharing time. We pray especially for those suffering in mind, body, or spirit, and we seek your healing touch for them. We pray for all those this day who are grieving the loss of a loved one and ask that you make real your grace and comfort in their lives. We pray for our nation and all the nations of the world, for all those individuals entrusted with responsibility to lead. We ask that they would be shrewd in doing good and following your will and not seeking to serve only self-interest. We pray for those people in our world who are suffering as a result of natural disasters, for those dealing with drought and fire in one place and flooding in another. Oh God, 
Be with those who seek to bring relief and strengthen those who are recovering day by day. Be with us all, O God, as we make our pilgrim way through this world and keep us faithful. For we lift this prayer and all our prayers to you in the name of Jesus, your Son, who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debt as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. We are invited at this time to share God's abundance in person or online or in whatever way you feel called to do so. All that we have and all that we are is a gift from God and while we can never repay God's gifts, we can offer what we have and serve the Lord faithfully by sharing some of the abundance with which we have been blessed. The ushers will wait upon you now for the morning offering.
Let us pray. Gracious God, thank you for all the good things you continue to provide for us. We ask that we not take your gifts for granted or misuse them. Instead, help us always to rely on you in faith and use us and what we have given this day for your good purposes. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Our closing hymn is number 697, and let's sing the first four verses.